A few quick things before, uh, before we get into the sermon number one. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Micah Griffin for moving this podium. If you just, if you're like, man, his biceps are like his soon-to-be dad biceps are flexing. This is actually a really heavy podium, so thank you, Micah, wherever you went. Uh, second of all, starting next Sunday, we have a July tradition of sorts where we only have one worship service in July. What time is it at? 10 a.m., 10 a.m. So please come to worship at 10 a.m., not 10.30, not 9 a.m., but come at 10 a.m., which means you'll probably get here at 10.10, 10, and that's okay. That's all right. We, uh, but we will have one worship service for the four Sundays in July. And then finally, just kind of a, uh, just, just something that gives me great joy this morning is that I have in worship this morning my oldest friend. So uh, outside of my family, uh, my friend Daniel and his family are here. I've known him since I was four years old. We went to school together. We went on mission trips together. And, uh, and I think it's been about 17 years since we actually worshiped together. And, uh, and it's just wonderful to have y'all here and to, uh, and to be here. So that, that, makes, that brings a special measure of joy. And clap for him because being my friend for 40-something years is not an easy thing. Not an easy thing. Okay, turn your Bibles to Psalm 109. Psalm 109. A uh, quick thing about the All Church Retreat. So we will be gathering St. Simon's Island the weekend of Labor Day from Saturday through Monday. We'll have a special speaker, Reverend Dr. Jim Birchfield. He was a pastor for 27 years, recently retired, and before that was an advertising exec, a successful one, and in his mid-30s experienced God's grace, and Jesus saved him and put him on a different trajectory. Uh, Jim has been a wonderful mentor and friend and his wife, Marta, uh, for many years. And I'm so excited for you to get to know them, for them to get to know you. And uh, his emphasis will be on abiding in Christ from John 15. What does it look like to abide in Christ and to receive joy in that relationship with Jesus? And in this season in the life of our country, we need to be abiding in Christ more now than ever, it seems like. It's also going to be a great opportunity to connect, and we've talked about this several times, that if you are new to the church or you've been here for a long time and you don't have friendships and you're feeling the call and the urge to take a step deeper in the community, deeper into relationships in the church, this is a great opportunity to do this. This is a great invitation to make, take your next step. This morning, we're in week four of our Messy Faith series where we're focusing on the Psalms and how does God's Word, particularly the Psalms, help us to pray during the messiest seasons of our life? How do the Psalms help us to pray during the messiest seasons of our life? Sometimes, our life is a mess because we made it that way, and sometimes it's a mess because other people made it that way, but how do we come before God honestly and openly in those messy seasons of life? So if you've been here for the last few weeks, what is a messy season of life that has come to mind for you? A messy season where you didn't know how to talk to God. Didn't know how to bring it before him or others. I have several messy seasons of life. I'll share one this morning. It's about 10 years ago, uh, in our church in Houston, we were going through a really intense, difficult time where we had to make some hard decisions, and the pastors and the session felt very clearly about where God was calling us, and there were people who didn't like that, and people who would do whatever it took to stop that, and that involved lying about us, lying about me, that involved gossiping, that involved slander. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been around a church where that's experienced, can you believe it? In a church, Christians, lying, gossip, slander, and there was one person in particular who was, who was just, just extra mean, and uh, someone who had been a friend, someone who I had offered to help uh, time, uh, time after time and tried to be an encouragement to, and they became really vindictive, toxic, angry, and again, the gossip and all that stuff that hurts so bad. 
And, uh, and so we came out of a particularly contentious meeting where that side felt that they had gained the upper hand on things and that they had successfully sunk the ship, if you will, and, uh, and done in very ugly ways. And we had tried so hard and prayed so hard to do things in a Christ-honoring way. And so the Sundays after that, they would come to church, and this person would come to church and sit about four rows away and just grin because they knew. They were just kind of bragging, and they were really, uh, they were gloating in the fact that they had wounded us, wounded me, and had us cornered in a sense, and I was mad. I was hurt, and I was mad. And now the setup in this sanctuary where I was before is a very traditional sanctuary. So if you've ever been in a really traditional church, the pastors don't get to sit with their families, do they? They have little thrones up on the stage that the pastors have to sit in, which I do not miss at all. But there I was, I was sitting in my little throne up on the stage in the chancel, and the pastor got up to preach, and, uh, and this person was sitting out there about five rows back, just gloating in it, just gloating in it. And I was so mad, so mad. So the pastor begins to preach. I can't hear a word he's saying. I can't because I'm so tangled up on the inside and so just in knots on the inside. I'm like, I gotta do something about it. Hey, I gotta do something about this. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, oh, Christians pray for things. I need to pray for this. I need to pray for this. That's what I'm gonna do. Okay, dear Jesus, please change my heart and Dear Jesus, please give me grace and mercy and love. Dear Jesus, I pray that whenever this person sets foot on our campus, you strike them with a disease. <laughs> and the second they leave our campus, that disease would go away, but the second they set foot here, that you would give them leprosy. Give them leprosy. And then take it away. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs> Amen. I felt a lot better about it. <laughs> felt a lot better about it, but I was so like tangled up on the inside and so in knots trying to figure out what to do with that that it was just, it was so hard, so hard. So Walter Brueggemann, who's done a, a lot of great work on the Old Testament, he organizes the prayers and the Psalms into three categories, orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. Say those with me. Orientation, disorientation, reorientation. So prayers in seasons of orientation, those are seasons of satisfaction, well-being. Things are going the way they're supposed to be going. So they're prayers of joy, prayers of delight, goodness, relying on God. Prayers of disorientation, those are seasons of anguish, seasons of loss where we're experiencing rage, resentment, self-pity, hatred. Those are the lament psalms. We spent last week in it. We're spending this week in it as well. Those are by far the largest genre of prayers in the book, which we need to pay attention to that. And then finally, Prayers of reorientation. So this is when you've been in a season of disorientation and God surprises you and brings you out of it into a new experience of life and love and light in him. So where there had been darkness before, now there is light. They're a new gift from God. But it's these prayers of disorientation that I want us to reflect upon because it's easy to pray in times of orientation. It's easy to pray when things are going well. We love those prayers. And it's in those seasons, it feels like our hearts and our brains, they're working just fine. But in seasons of disorientation, praying becomes much more difficult. The words are harder to find and perhaps the motivation as well. We want God to show up and fix it, but for whatever reason, we don't want to hand it over to God or we don't want to pray to him because we're mad at him or mad at ourselves or we're just too sad. 
So moving from a season of orientation to a season of disorientation can be overwhelming and shocking. Brueggemann describes it this way. He says, it constitutes a dismantling of the old known world and a relinquishment of safe, reliable confidence in God's good creation. The lament psalm is a painful anguished articulation of a move into disarray and dislocation, an unwilling embrace of a new situation of chaos, devoid of the coherence that marked God's good creation. It's experienced as a personal end of the world. How many of you have experienced the depth of that sadness or grief or anger where it feels like the end of the world. And he says, if it were not that, it would not generate such passionate poetry. So Psalms of Lament articulate these emotions and experiences that don't feel welcome at church and don't feel welcome in the Christian life. It can feel like we've done something wrong or maybe there's something wrong with our trust in God if these things are happening. There are churches out there that will teach that, that'll say if you're experiencing anger, revenge, grief, sadness that's overwhelming, it's because you're not believing hard enough. Or this is happening to you because of something that you did, and that's wrong. That is false. That is untrue. Last week we looked at Psalm 88 a psalm that focused on sadness and depression and how we pray when we feel like we're drowning in grief and sorrow and sadness. This week we're going on a different emotion uh, that we often don't know how to bring into the faith or into the community in an appropriate way, and that is anger. So what do you do when you're angry? How do you handle it? Do you go work out? Do you go for a run? Do you eat do you binge on whatever your addiction of choice is? Do you go all incredible Hulk, Hulk smash? Do you yell at people, break stuff, pray about it? How about, how about you keyboard warriors? Do you post about it on Facebook? It's a really unhealthy way to work your anger out. So if you're doing that, stop it. How do you handle your anger? Anger is very different from sadness or anxiety. It affects us in polar opposite ways, don't they? So to illustrate that, I want you to imagine you're wandering through the dark woods at night where there have been bear sightings. Okay, everybody there, it's a real happy thought, a real wonderful place to be. You're wandering through the dark woods, there have been bear sightings, okay? Anxiety says to me, a bear could attack me at any moment. So I need to constantly be looking over my shoulder and scared to death that something bad is going to happen. Depression says to me, you know that bear's gonna eat me eventually, so I might as well just lay down and let it go ahead and come eat me now. But anger says to me, I can punch that bear in the face and take it out. In fact, I could fight my way out of a forest full of bears, right? Sadness and depression, they make me feel, they're downers. They make me feel down, but anger, revenge, they're an upper. They motivate us in a different way. Sadness and depression make me feel like I am beat down. Anger makes me want to put the beat down on someone else or a group of someone else's. Sadness makes me slow to react. Anger makes me want to overreact. I had a roommate in college who was passionate about College football. Anybody know somebody who's passionate about college football? He had a particular SEC team that he rooted for. And when we would watch that game, like he was a good guy. He was a great guy, just a genuine, generous guy until his college football team started losing. And then his demeanor would change and he would get mad. I mean, like his face would contort. The entire rest of the weekend was wrecked. And unfortunately, he cheered for a football team that lost a lot. So he had some, fall was a bad time of year for him. But anger affects us in so many different ways. How many of us have embarrassing moments that come to mind when we let our anger get the best of us? 
or perhaps when our spouse or a family member did and it embarrassed us. If we're honest, all of us do. Anger can be embarrassing because we can get so overwhelmed by it that we become nonsensical. So it's acceptable for a little kid to throw a temper tantrum, but have you ever been around an adult that throws a temper tantrum? It's not cute anymore. For me, anger is not an addiction, but oh, there's so many words and actions I wish I could take back. I wish I could take back times where I've lashed out or I've intentionally formed verbal daggers that I could hurl across the room at someone. So when anger is eating away at us, when it has blinded us and has us lost, similar to how sadness and grief and depression can, how do we not repress it and bottle it up or let it become like poison that's inside us or become a rage that we unleash with violent words or violent actions? How do we bring it before the Lord and take steps in inviting the Lord into the midst of it with us. So I want you to think back to the story I shared earlier about how even pastors can feel overwhelmed with anger and kind of appreciate that moment with me. You know, it's like, was that an overreaction? I'm going to pray leprosy on this person. <laughs> Maybe. I can make a case that it wasn't. But I was sitting there stuck in my anger and stuck in my hurt, stuck in my woundedness, and I wasn't sure what to do with it. I, as a pastor, as a perceived holy man, was literally sitting in the sanctuary, and I had to get backed into a corner emotionally to get myself to pray. And then once I got there, I had to get a running start into it multiple times so I could utter something that felt so like terrible to say, but was honest. It was honest about where I was at. Is that not just absurd? But I would bet that there are a lot of you who have felt that way at one time or another, where you've come into this room or you've come into a small group or a Bible study and we sang great praise songs and we had great prayers and positive things, but inside you're like, I am so busted up. And I don't know, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to bring it before the Lord. I don't know how to be honest. So this is where God's word helps us. Just like the psalm last week helps us articulate in our grief, so our psalm we're going to look at this week helps us articulate in our anger. So I'm going to introduce you to a concept that most of you have probably never heard of. They're called imprecatory prayers, or prayers of imprecation, psalms of imprecation. The word imprecate means to pray evil against. Doesn't that sound lovely? to invoke disaster upon. So imprecatory prayers call down judgment on an enemy. They're the type of prayers that we read and we say we're not allowed to talk that way. Psalm 88 last week, we felt that way because it's so sad, so miserable, and now these psalms we're going to look at today because they're so angry and sometimes brutal. So for example, Psalm 35 Verse 4, may those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Psalm 69, may the table set before them become a snare. May it become retribution and a trap. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. So they're praying that somebody goes blind and has chronic back problems the rest of their life. Psalm 139. We love Psalm 139. Some of us can quote parts of it off the top of our head. You've searched me and known me. When I was in my mother's womb, you knew me. You knit me together. Well, there are a few verses in that beautiful, heartwarming psalm. We, we read the little babies that we skip over. Verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. 
Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. So if you read Psalms like that, if you've done that before, you've come across language like this and you've felt, that's really weird. And I don't know what to do with it. You are not alone. You are not alone. So common reactions we have when we read some of these enemy statements in the Psalms, uh, maybe we feel like, doesn't Jesus say to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you? Or wait a second, we're not supposed to feel that way. That's, that's not very Christian of them. Or maybe this is exactly why I don't read the Old Testament. The New Testament is not mean-spirited like that. Now, in reality, when we read the New Testament, Jesus utters curses, Paul utters curses. There are curses in Revelation as well. There are curses in the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you look at... Uh, Say the great command in the New Testament, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Where does that come from? It comes from the Old Testament. It comes from Leviticus and Deuteronomy. There's so much more continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament than we give credit for. But Isaac Watts, one of the famous hymn writers, he saw these as diametrically opposed to the Spirit of God. C.S. Lewis said, one way of dealing with these terrible prayers is simply to leave them alone. (laughs) Ignore them. Ignore them. But I appreciate what David Taylor, who was here a few weeks ago preaching, says. He writes this in his book, Open and Unafraid. He says, I'd like to think that Lewis is wrong on this. We do not leave them alone. We trust instead that God has given us the angry psalms, the angry prayers, to help us feel angry without being undone by our anger. We trust that he's given us these angry psalms, these angry prayers, to help us feel angry without being undone by our anger. We trust that God has given us these psalms to rescue us from the desire to do violence to others. Notice in all these psalms, it's not a license to be violent to others, but it's entrusting these violent thoughts or desire for revenge or expressions of anger, anger, expressing it to God. He goes on, we trust that God has given us these psalms to heal and unite us and to show us the possibility of a faithful anger. So that brings us to our text this morning, Psalm 109. So a few weeks ago, Hawley, when he preached, he introduced you to the term a banger, which would be a popular song that's really catchy. I'm going to introduce you to a different modern music term that fits our psalm today, and that is a diss track. D-I-S-S, diss track. Has anyone heard of these? So a diss track or a diss song is a song whose primary purpose is to verbally attack someone. Doesn't that sound lovely for our word today? So like last week's psalm, this one may be uncomfortable for you. You've likely never heard of this psalm or read it. And if you have, you probably kept reading as fast as you could and got away from it quickly. It is the most extreme example of an imprecatory psalm. So keep that in mind. You might even find it funny, and that's okay. It's okay to laugh at how cringy this psalm gets. But just like last week, you may be thinking this is too dark, doesn't apply to you, and makes you uncomfortable, but I guarantee you there is somebody sitting within 10 or 15 feet of you that this anger, this rage, This revenge is eating them from the inside out, that there is a wound deep there. And so, listen to it for them. Try to put yourself in their shoes as you hear this psalm, or put yourself in the psalmist's shoes as you hear it. So, you can follow along in your Bibles or on your screens as I read it aloud, Psalm 109. My God, whom I praise, do not remain silent. For people who are wicked and deceitful have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. 
In return for my friendship, they accuse me. But I'm a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. Appoint someone evil to oppose my enemy. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their ruined homes. May a creditor seize all he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his labor. May no one extend kindness to him or take pity on his fatherless children. May his descendants be cut off, their names blotted out from the next generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord. May the sin of his mother never be blotted out. May their sin always remain before the Lord that he may blot out their name from the earth. For he never thought of doing a kindness but hounded to death the poor, the needy, the brokenhearted. He loved to pronounce a curse. May it come back on him. He found no pleasure in blessing. May it be far from him. He wore cursing as his garment. It entered into his body like water, into his bones like oil. May it be like a cloak wrapped about him, like a belt tied forever around him. May this be the Lord's payment to my accusers, to those who speak evil of me. But you, sovereign Lord, help me for your name's sake. Out of the goodness of your love, deliver me, for I am poor and needy. My heart is wounded within me. I fade away like an evening shadow. I am shaken off like a locust. My knees give way from fasting, and my body is thin and gaunt. I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they shake their heads. Help me, Lord my God. Save me according to your unfailing love. Let them know that it is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. While they curse, may you bless. May those who attack me be put to shame, but may your servant rejoice. May my accusers be clothed with disgrace and wrapped in shame as in a cloak. For my mouth, I will greatly extol the Lord. In the great throng of worshipers, I will praise him, for he stands at the right hand of the needy to save their lives from those who would condemn them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And it really is. It really is in there. It's in the Bible, folks. So let me make a few observations about, about this prayer. So the first thing, there's a difference between good anger and bad anger. Between righteous anger and petty, selfish anger. There's a lot of bad anger at work in our culture, isn't there? Back before COVID, I don't remember if you read any of the analysis of our culture that we had an addiction to outrage. Does anyone remember that? I feel like we've blown the doors over that, off that in the last few years. Outrage always has a megaphone in our culture whether it's social media, news outlets, YouTube, or late night TV. Culturally, we as Americans, we move from one outrage to the next with alarming speed. We always get that emotional high that anger gives us, and we never come off of it. So keep in mind, whatever your news outlet is, whichever one you like to watch, they want you to make enemies out of your neighbors. Keep that in mind as we go into this fall. They want you to make enemies out of your neighbors, neighbors on your street, and neighbors in your pews. Don't let them do that. We have this addiction to anger and outrage in our culture. But there's a difference between good anger and bad anger. So when we see what the psalmist is angry about from Verse 16, he says, this person he's angry at, he never thought of doing kindness. He hounded to death the poor, the needy, the brokenhearted. He loved to pronounce a curse. He had no pleasure in blessing. He wore cursing like his clothes. And when he's doing this, he's placing it all in God's hands. He's declaring all of this to God, this righteous anger. Uh, this one commentary written by J.A. Motiri says this. He says, these prayers, these angry prayers, 
calling, they're calling upon God to remedy those injustices where neither we as individuals or the government are competent to remedy. They do not seek personal vengeance. Rather, they leave vengeance to God just as God commanded. So there's a difference between good anger and bad anger, righteous anger and selfish, petty anger. Second thing, we need to be honest and call evil evil, call an enemy an enemy. Christian niceties are rarely ever actually helpful. Being polite is a good life skill, but sometimes having good manners and being polite stunts our prayer life and our spiritual life because we fail to label things the way they need to be labeled. We fail to label situations and call them what they are. It doesn't help to call evil good. It doesn't help to dress up sin and call it blessed. It doesn't help to dress up an injustice and call it okay. Someone who is perpetrating injustice against another is an enemy. Someone who takes advantage of the vulnerable, the elderly, children, they are an enemy. People who dehumanize others, same thing. That is a fact. The Bible deals in facts and reality, not in speculation, no matter how messy reality is. The Bible is not concerned with making things look clean and orderly and sanitary when they are so obviously not. And that's the beautiful thing about Psalm 109, because Psalm 109 is honest about what a mess my heart is. Psalm 109 is an honest expression pouring out to God the anger, the wounds, the hurt, the revenge. All that is jumbled up in the heart is laid out before God in a very honest way. Now, one scholar noted that there are at least 94 different terms in the Psalms used to describe enemies. 94 different terms. So that includes predatory beasts, bulls, snakes, armies, evildoers, prophet hunters, death. It includes friends who betray us, other nations, tribes, liars, bullies, people who destroy creation, people who take advantage of the vulnerable, People who pillage defenseless villages, who deceive the elderly, who mistreat children. David Taylor writes that looking at the book of Psalms, it seems that enemy talk does in fact have a place in the life of faith. Enemy language belongs to faithful living. Not because the Psalter comes out of a, an ancient culture that doesn't know any better, but because enemy language is faithfully honest about life in a fractured and often cruel world. It's honest about other people and their capacity to harm, including our own. And the last observation I want to make is this. This psalm and these prayers, it's not just word vomiting our anger. It's not just another diss track. It's not... Uh, anything like that, it is entrusting our anger to God. It's actually an expression of trust in God's providential authority over his creation. So praying these types of psalms is a matter of honestly naming our experience of life and of our enemies. The rage, the sorrow, the feeling of utter helplessness, the sense of injustice, the irrationality of it all. All in order to entrust one's enemies to God. The enemy language reminds us that this is a violent and sinful world we live in. That there are violent and sinful humans and that we can be like that. Theologian John Frame wrote this. He says, these prayers, these angry prayers are like all prayers in that there's always the qualification implicit in the phrase, thy will be done, or in Jesus' name. When we ask for things, we should do it with the realization that our ultimate desire is God's glory. If God will be glorified in giving us our request, then we thank him. If he is more glorified in denying our request, our prayer has not become useless, for all prayer is a recommitment of ourselves to God's purpose, God's kingdom. 
So what do we do with these? What do we do with these weird, angry, harsh prayers in the middle of our Bible? The first thing I'd say is that we recognize that it's not a mistake that they are in the Bible. Jesus never qualified the Old Testament and said, throw out whatever you disagree with or whatever makes you uncomfortable. Do you know what the book of the Bible that Jesus quotes the most? Psalms. This was, in a sense, Jesus' favorite book of the Bible. The same Jesus who commanded us to love our enemies is the same God who made sure Psalm 109 and Psalm 88 are in our Bibles. It's the same God. They didn't sneak it past him. He made sure these prayers were in the Bible. He's the same God who is the God of justice and declares vengeance is mine. He's the same God who is abounding in steadfast love, mercy, and grace. And we need him to be all of those things. We are not wise enough. We are not controlled enough. We are not loving enough or just enough to do any of those things. We need Jesus to be all of those. But when we come to the New Testament, we are ultimately forced to look in the mirror. In Paul's letters, who does he describe as the enemy? Does anybody know? Us. Us. Romans 5, he says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. Colossians 1, he writes, Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies because of your evil behavior. But now... God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. So where we're left in this is, is number one, this tension in our hearts that we need to have of how do we express ourselves honestly to God? Like we have this broken part of us that experience anger and hurt and revenge and grief and loss, and we need to be honest about that. There is no emotion that you experience so passionately, so deeply, that you can't bring it to God. They are all welcome to be brought to Him. Even if that anger is not at you, not at somebody else, but directly at Him, you can take that to Him. That's what we're supposed to do. He can receive that. So we have this lesson we need to learn or this action we need to learn or however we want to look at it of how are we honest before God about the deepest rawest messiest parts of our hearts and our lives but then also recognizing this God who we were once his enemy and he chose to love us and chose to extend mercy and grace to us that we didn't deserve and forgiveness to us that we didn't deserve so we have this broken nature still at work in us but we have the spirit of jesus also and when we turn these things over to god in prayer and honesty it opens the door for him to do work and it can be a long work it can be a slow work it can be a painful work for that anger that revenge that resentment to be overtaken, if you will, by Christ's mercy, by his grace, and by his good news. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that even when we were considered your enemies, either by our thoughts, by our actions, by our words. We were your enemies, some worse than others. You chose to love us. That's a, a love we can't produce on our own. 
And it's certainly not one that I feel very often, and probably many of us. So Lord, I pray that you would hear our honest prayers, that you would hear our cries of anger, of resentment, of rage, revenge, that you would hear our cries of anxiety and fear, our cries of sadness and depression, that you would receive those, and that you would do a work in our hearts that only you can do. And I lift up specifically those who are listening this morning or here at church who, yeah, this is their experience right now. They are where the psalmist is. They are, they're angry, they're wounded. They have a righteous indignation at what is going on and they're crying out to you. Lord, give them the words for how to do that. I pray that you'll give them relief from that anger a peace that passes all understanding because it doesn't come from circumstances or from people, it comes from you. Lord, we pray that as we learn to talk to you and walk with you in the messiest seasons of our life, that you would do a beautiful work in us and in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand and let us sing together.